Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Hi, this is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming to us from Fairfield, Iowa, is Jay Boyle. Jay is 75 years young and happily married to the love of his life, Lenora Boyle, and he has two children, Grace and David. After returning to America from Vietnam, he went to college, learned to meditate, and then became a wholesale colored gemstone dealer. His career took off after he learned about the ancient esoteric use of gemstones, which came out of India, and he decided to bring loose gemstones to the world on television in 1989. 43 years later, he is still employed by Jewelry Television and also running his own company specializing in gemstones for astrology. I'm going to try to get into all that and more today and obviously ask him about his opinions on death, dying, and the living process. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. Our first question that we ask people is how old are they, which you already had in your bio. But uh, where did you grow up and what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Well, that's an interesting question. I uh, grew up pretty much in two two locations. Uh, uh, my, my father raised greyhounds, so in the summer I was outside of Boston, uh, usually for three or four months every summer, and then St. Petersburg, Florida, the west coast of Florida, uh, during the eight or nine months of the wintertime. So I kind of grew up in both places. My mother's Italian family was from Boston. And, uh, well, I certainly belong to some generation, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, because I'm still working, I love gemstones, and I have uh, my own staff or younger women. They're in their 30s and 40s, and at Jewelry Television, right, there are people from their 20s all the way up into their 70s. So, you know, when you work with a whole range of uh, ages, you don't feel like you're really one generation or the other. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I actually completely agree. Um, it's part of why I love actually getting out there and meeting, quote unquote, younger people, because I think there's a lot of like myths, rumors and stereotypes circulating and trying to separate us all. So I, I totally appreciate what you said. Um, and also, it's kind of interesting because my dad is not the Italian side of my family, but he's from Boston and my mom is the Italian side and she's from the St. Petersburg, Tampa area. And as you already know, my dad used to uh, bet on the Greyhounds down in Tampa. So that's a lot of fun commonalities. And before I let it slip from my mind, um, you have a theory that your mother, my mother and you might be related, which by extension would make us related. Do you want to go ahead and proffer that here? Well, yes. My, uh, my mother's uh, parents were both from Santa Caterina, Sicily, right in the center of Sicily, small town of about 5,000 today. And uh, as it turned out, uh, you know, your, your mom uh, was from a town of about you know, maybe 10 kilometers away. And, uh, and we both share my mother's maiden name was Provenzano as, as was your mother's uh, maiden name. And it was spelled the same way with a E instead of an A. So there's a lot of similarities. Plus your mom kind of looks like a first cousin, more first cousins do. (laughs) Yeah. I am just for the record, I am endorsing your theory and I'm on your side. Um, My mom isn't so sure, but that's kind of her answer to a lot of things. But uh, I definitely, it all adds up to me. And then actually, since you seem to understand the spelling of the name and all that, I've always been curious, are are we, assuming we are related, uh, also related to the terrible mafia family from the same name from Sicily? You know, it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't have any factual knowledge one way or the other. However, I was given, uh, portraits of my great grandparents those are my uh, parents of my grandmother and grandfather both from sicily and the portrait of my great grandfather which was the provenzano side mike i can i can send you a picture afterwards it looks remarkably like the like the dawn that was on the run for 25 years it was captured during the last five or six years in Sicily. There's a there's a family resemblance there, so it's it's a little spooky to tell you the truth. Yeah. Not the nicest guy. And actually I think that's kind of related to the theme of the show, which is like, are we really a product of people we're related to? Is all that just kind of imaginary? Are we different souls? Are we reincarnating? So uh I do want to get into gemstones. I'm ex- extremely interested in all that. But before I do, I'd kind of like you to start with just like the esoteric use of gemstones, as you said, which comes from the Yodish part of the Indian culture. Yes, the uh, the 
the esoteric uh, use of gemstones comes out of uh, ancient India. Uh, there's a system of health called Ayurveda. Many people have heard of it these days. It's the Indian uh, uh, system of health and well-being. Within Ayurveda, there is a branch called Jyotish and J-Y-O-T-I-S-H, which is essentially its ancient Indian Vedic astrology. It's similar to Western astrology, but, but varies in a number of different ways. Uh, and it's highly predictive of uh, not only past and present, but also future. And, and that's one of the ways that it differs from Western astrology. The uh, Indian scholars uh, say that this, this uh, some of the writings from these ancient sages goes back somewhere, you know, like 1,200 years to 4,000 years, a little bit of a, a lack of agreement there. But essentially, it's a type of astrology based upon your exact time date and place of birth and where the planets were on the horizon at that moment of time which then that's that's the uh, astrological chart it's a mathematical uh, formula 12 houses and seven planets and there are rules uh, depending on the rising sign and how the chart is constructed what gem you can wear i'll just quickly go through it cool the uh, planets are uh, related to gemstones and the uh, diamond is for the planet Venus, ruby for the planet Sun, yellow sapphire is the planet Jupiter, Mars is the planet uh, is a red is red coral, Mercury is emerald, and Saturn is blue sapphire. And uh, have I missed any here? I don't, let's see. Then there are a couple of uh, shadow planets, which are called Rahu and Ketu, and 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 they are they're the intersection in the sky. They aren't real planets. They're the intersection in the sky where lunar eclipses happen. And based on where the planets are in the twelve houses in the chart and various rules, that the story is my in ancient times in India when there was a more of a golden age where many people were enlightened. The most enlightened sages of that time cognized these rules of karma related to the planets. So it's a it's a it's it's a planetary phenomena for human beings on Earth. It's a solar phenomena, has to do with karma, and it's uh, you know I, I, for the first twelve years when I heard about it, I just said, how could this be possible? Later on, I I heard back from them from a number of clients that how it changed their life. And then I started wearing my own gems. And by this point, you know, 35, 40 years in, I'm quite a believer in this. Yeah. And actually I think it segues into the very first question I wanted to ask you, you in your own bio said you're 75 years young and I've heard people use that phrase. And yet I've looked at them and been like, actually you're pretty old. You are without any doubt, one of the youngest acting, looking and sounding 75 year olds, <laughs> if not 65 year olds I've ever met. I just saw you, I mean, a couple months ago. I would never have guessed you were uh, had that many years here on Earth. Uh, do Does your attitude towards these gemstones and all that have anything to do with that? Well, thank you for saying that. And and I do get that uh, more, more often than not. People uh, guess my age is younger. Um, I, I would guess, and I believe, that the uh, because I do wear uh, quite... Uh, good quality gemstones that are that are for my health and for my longevity and my prosperity and i've been wearing them since uh 1989 um and if i had to you know uh, my opinion is yes they've contributed to my health and to my uh apparent youthfulness i mean there's a lot of interesting research being on, going on right now about aging and how it can be slowed down and you know, exercise, diet, genetics is a, probably what I've been what I'm reading is about twenty percent, eighty percent is lifestyle. So eating well, sleeping well. I've also been doing a type of meditation for forty seven, forty eight years. So that you know, calmness, uh, how you relate to stress, exercise, sleep, certain types of vitamins, and uh, all these things have, are kind of on the cutting edge of of, of what is contributes to aging or the slowing down of aging. So 
I think the gemstones also do it, certainly in, in, in my case, but that's my short, long answer to your question. No, no, that was a great answer. And I think it's funny because it's on the cutting edge of like today's modern science. And yet it's also the oldest science in the world, which is Ayurvedic, like, you know, avoiding stress and like you said, toxins in the body and all that. So um, I think it's just helpful for people listening because... There's a lot of avenues and paths, but also, like you said, genetics is going to be a big part of it. And actually, that's even more uh, evidence, I think, that we are related because my mother, as you know, is also pretty young for her age. And uh, my grandfather, her father, the one from Sicily, lived to be uh, 92 and he was as sharp as they come till 91. And then it was just like a short six months. So, And I guess now would be a good time to ask you, since... Over the years, you've come to terms with like the idea that maybe karma is real and, and this ancient system of Ayurvedic science is real, and you meditate and all that. Uh, what is your philosophy on what happens when you die? Hey, everybody. Did you know that I write novels? Well, I do, and I have a new one out, and it's called Ardor, and it's about a world-famous psychic traveling around trying to stop other psychics from ruining everything on Earth. It's a fun read. A ton of people have already read it and loved it. So head over to MikeyOp.com, click the big link, and get your copy today. Thanks a lot. No one knows for sure, but my belief is that uh, energy, which is, uh, you know, there's the physical body, and there's also perhaps in the in the Ayurvedic system of, of, of the esoteric nature of the physical body, there are subtle bodies also, you know, uh, various... Religions talk about the soul. I I I tend to believe that that the the soul perhaps persists after life leaves the body, the last breath. And uh, you know we have there's a there's a lot of talk of uh, different different places you can go. Um, and I you know and then you read the near death experiences. There's been a lot of uh, interesting articles and books about that where people. Uh, die and then come back because of modern uh, technology. They die on the operating table and then two or three minutes they come back. They all report sometimes a very similar experience of seeing the light, going towards the light, feeling love, acceptance, oftentimes seeing relatives and, uh, you know, a very uh, idyllic uh, situation. All of that, I figure, you know, if it doesn't happen and nothing happens, then I won't know. But that's probably what I think might happen. Life goes on. Wow. So as you age, do you start to ask yourself and think about this more? Yes. I mean, certainly uh, I can recall when I turned 60, I went, wow, I can see 70 from here. <laughs> and then when I turned 70, five and a half years ago, I said, wow, I can see 80 from here. So at a cert- at, at, at my age... Uh, you know, life expectancy is uh, not many more years on average. So there is uh, a natural tendency of the mind to consider how many years are left. I want to live the best I can. Uh, and that's one reason I exercise and spend as much time as I can with my family, eat, eat good foods. So it's, uh, you do think about it much more so than when you did when you were younger. Although, Mike, I can remember when I was in my 20s, uh, it, strange as this sounds, you know, this was after I went to Vietnam and I came back from Vietnam and I went to college, University of Florida in Gainesville in the early 70s. I can remember thinking, I don't even think I'm going to live to be 30. Now, why I thought that at this point, I can't remember. But so at different stages of your life, you do see the future in different ways. And when you get a little older, you do think about the end. But it just makes the present all that much more wonderful. That's cool. And that's what I'm finding. I'm 42 right now. And I'm definitely feeling that like, instead of this dread or like attachment to what's obviously happening to myself and everyone I love, I'm starting to just spend all of that energy of stress and worry that I would have done in my twenties had I been preoccupied with instead just trying to be nicer to everyone, including myself. And I, I think that's part of why I really enjoyed seeing you last time. And then another thing I wanted to bring up is that you You wrote it in your own bio that you're married to the love of your life, but it's also extremely obvious when you see the two of you together. Um, when did you guys meet? I graduated from college and uh, here in Fairfield, and she went out to Santa Monica, California, and I had decided to become a gem dealer in the summer of 79, and the pathway that was suggested was to become a gemologist, to go to the 
GIA, the Gemological Institute of America in Santa Monica at that time. So I knew one person out there and I called her. She said, come on out, you can sleep on my couch while you're looking for a place to stay. And Lenora was uh, a roommate. And so we met right away. It, it was interesting, our first six months, it, 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 Mike, it wasn't love at first sight. It was a kind of a deep uh, appreciation and friendship like we had been friends forever. Uh, instead of a romantic relationship. It was that way for the first six or seven months. And then uh, that at one point, uh, you know, the uh, Cupid shot us both with the, uh, with the proverbial arrows and we both fell off a cliff into, in, into, into love. And, you know, she is a remarkable, a wonderful woman, a dear friend of, of your, of your mom. They're like mm -hmm. best buds. And, uh, I'm fortunate to, you know, to have, to have found such an extraordinary lady to be, you know, to live my life with. Yeah. And I feel the same way about my wife. And it's always interesting when I see other people because I had to wait forever to meet her. I mean, that's a joke, but it was, I met her when I was 36. And I mean, it just felt long and grueling, but it was worth it. So I, I like to ask people like you so people can hear the individual stories. And, and also, I think it is important to mention that, like, Sometimes there's just a foundation of trust or even friendship, uh, you know, and then things come in different orders and all that. Do you have advice for impatient people? Yeah, sure. Just take a couple of deep breaths, relax. Everything is unfolding and just uh, be in the moment. That's the only thing that matters is the present. The past doesn't exist. The future may never come. Don't waste your time. Just be here now and uh if you're impatient, just take a couple of deep breaths. It'll pass. That's awesome. That's really cool. And uh, yeah, I listen to a lot of Ram Dass podcasts from his old lectures, and he's so helpful with that, just because you mentioned Be Here Now. And then, not my final question, but I want to segue into your career, because it's it's utterly fascinating to me. So speaking of being in the moment, what was the moment where you like even thought about like gemstones, let alone buying and selling them wholesale? Uh, that's a yeah. That's a, I'll, I'll try to make it a short story. Okay. I, I've been drafted. Went to Vietnam during the big buildup in Vietnam in nineteen. I was drafted in sixty seven, and from sixty seven and sixty eight, I spent a year in Vietnam. Afterwards, I got out, went to college, and uh, studied speech pathology because I used to be a stutterer, and I, I overcame that. Uh, but I didn't want to work in that field. And but I felt like there was something out there that was th that I wanted to find. I was looking for my career. I didn't have a clue what it was. I was totally clueless. I just knew that there was something, something I'd love to do. It wouldn't be work, and it would be different and exciting. That's all I knew. And for about seven years, I was just constantly asking, what is it? What am I supposed to do with my life? And uh, at, there was a certain point I was on a long meditation course, and I had a kind of a major aha moment friend of mine pointed a friend of his out and said, that's my friend. He imports rubies from Thailand. And I heard that phrase and I'd never, Mike, I'd never collected gems or thought about gems once in my entire life. But I heard that phrase, rubies from Thailand. And I was instantly new. It wasn't like that sounds interesting. It was an instant, absolute certainty. That's what I've been looking for. And then I ran up to him, how do I get in the business? He said, it's not easy. He gave me some advice. I didn't take it. I jumped in and learned the hard way for the next 20 years and finally figured it out. The last 25 years have been very good for me. That's so cool. That's such a great story. And so, you know, a part of why the story is so interesting to me is um, you were on the cutting edge as like the idea of starting to bring this to television. So can you tell us that part of the story from 1989? Yes. Uh... When I jumped in the business in 1980, I didn't know what I was doing. I borrowed a lot of money. I went broke in 1985. And then I was uh, working for a guy in 86, and he was one of the first infomercials. Uh, 1986 is when selling on television started. It started with infomercials, and about the same time, TV shopping started. It started in America, nowhere else. And I was working for a fellow that, was a, uh, that, that, that had a long-form infomercial and I kept asking the one question for ever, ever since I went broke. Who buys gems? How can I make a living? I didn't have the answer to that, which is why I failed. And then at one point I had my second aha moment when my daughter was born. Talk about karma. Maybe when she came in, the aha moment came. I'll go on TV and reveal the secret side of the gem business. Now, Mike, in 1986, 
I had failed in the gen business. I knew nothing about the secret side of the gen business, but the aha was I'll go on TV and reveal the secret side of the gen business, which I did about, let's see, in 1994, I got on TV for the first time. And then uh, from 99 on, I was on TV for ex extensively doing just that, revealing the secret side of the gen business, talking about why, what country I went to, how I negotiated the stones, where they were, where they were found, how they were formed, what, why it's a good deal. Literally explaining that which had always been secret and, and in, only the insiders knew. And we were the first people on, in the world to put loose gemstones on television at, you know, really good information, the truth and full disclosure. And that was part of the reason why I became a very successful gem dealer, being, being the buyer that for the first company to put gems on television, the first in the world. And then they became the largest seller of gems in the world. And, and, I, and I was very busy for the next 15 or 20 years uh, buying those gems for them. That's incredible. And did you ever get any like threats or like backlash from those who wanted it to remain a secret? Uh, no, but that's a good question, Mike. Uh, uh, no, because I was always uh, I was promoting gemstones generally to the public, explaining them how and plus giving access to gemstones like never before. Uh, the the advent of selling gems on TV started with us in the in the mid 90s, but starting in about 2000 is when it really exploded. And because I was I was uh, buying gems at an ever increasing rate, uh, then I became one of the biggest buyers in the world. I was appreciated at all the major cutting and mining centers around the world that I traveled to over and over and over again as the guy that brought gems to television in the United States. So they didn't really dislike me. They kind of liked me because I was a great customer for everybody that was mining and cutting gems. I was the best customer around. Wow. So I've heard this before that it was in the early 1900s in America that people started associating diamonds with weddings and rings. Is that true? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is true. It was, uh, it, it's, uh, as I understand it, it was a, it was a it was a marketing marketing campaign. Uh, the Oppenheimer family, starting in the late 1800s, uh, began to uh, buy up mining sites in uh, South African area where the, where uh, some of the big mines of, of diamonds were first located. And then they they came up with the idea of having a cartel of buying the diamonds, whether it was a recession or not, and stockpiling them so that the price would never go down. And they came up with a marketing campaign, <clears throat> Diamonds Are Forever, and, 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 and put a lot of time and effort into telling that story. Now, diamonds are the hardest of all gems, but they're not that rare. Mm -hmm. But that story of diamonds should be, should be bought for everyone that gets uh, engaged, that was promoted by the De Beers marketing cartel. And it's interesting, in Japan, uh, in the, the 50s and the 60s, there was uh, Japanese wives never got a diamond engagement ring, but the De Beers marketing cartel, the people that wanted to promote diamonds, they identified Japan as a rising economic interest back when they were poor. And they began to market to the Japanese market, telling Japanese wives and, and husbands, you must have a diamond, a high quality diamond, if you're, if you're going to be married. And, that culture went from never having a diamond to be married to must have the finest quality diamond on earth, a complete change, which was done through marketing. And that's kind of the story of how diamonds became very, very popular. Wow, that's so fascinating. Um, and I kind of have two questions from that. Um, one would be based on like Ayurvedic science and all that, uh, wouldn't it be more advisable for each person to give their potential spouse the actual like gemstone that matches their rising sign yes uh, that's that's true and the other side of my business besides selling and buying for television is selling and and buying for uh, ayurvedic indian astrology which is like you said based upon your particular rising sign there is a gem that you can wear and that will uh that will improve certain areas of, of your life. It could be any area in life. It could be income, career, marriage, health, relationships, any any part of life that 
based upon the the uh, the particular karma that is reflected in your in your in the astrological chart where the planets were when you were born. An astrologer can look at that and say, this person, for instance, I'm supposed to wear the stone for Venus and the stone for Mercury, diamonds and emeralds. And for me, uh, when I wear diamonds and emeralds, I have greater success, greater income, and my career advances. And certainly once I started wearing my gems is when I started to you know, get near TV, get on TV, and then uh, within a matter of years, I became a very important buyer. Even though I wasn't buying with my own money, I was I was buying more than than most people in, on planet Earth for many years. I believe my gemstones, which were that was the predicted results, income, career, also health, helped me along those ways. So, yes, I if if someone's thinking of getting married, I think it's a great idea to. Uh, give the gemstone that will that will be beneficial to that individual and that individual relationship. It's still kind of uh, esoteric secret knowledge, but my uh, website, astrologicalgemstones.com, has a lot of information. We have a blog there also that can that can explain all of this in greater detail. Very cool. I don't like jewelry. I don't like the feel of things on me. I wear a wedding ring, but I've actually asked my wife if we can just get tattoos instead. It's not to say that I don't appreciate the beauty of gemstones and all that. So I have two questions because I am in actually interested in, in doing this. One, does the size of it matter? And two, like where do you have to put it on your body? Okay, so the first part, the size, generally two carats or more is recommended. However, diamonds and rubies are quite powerful, even in one carat size, and 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 that would be sufficient for if you were recommended to wear a ruby, the planet for the sun, or diamond, uh, the planet for Venus. So you know, one to two carats if it's a ruby or a, a diamond, uh, two to four carats if it's some of the other gemstones, and you know, I, M Mike, I was. Very much like you, I never, ever wore jewelry. So when I wore my first gemstone, I decided to wear it as a pendant because I didn't want to wear rings or anything like that. And it's uh, it's quite interesting. The, the vast majority of the people that come to my business to buy gems for astrology, they're buying gems for more of a spiritual reason than the normal jewelry industry, which is about kind of, you know, flash and... You know, it's it's it, it's really not about spirituality, which is what the Jotis Gemstone business is all about. The vast majority of my clients that come to me for the last 35 years, the first thing they say is, "I don't like jewelry, I don't wear jewelry, uh, but yet I'm I'm considering doing this." So it's uh, you can you can wear a pendant or you can wear a ring, and it should be worn close to the body. But those are the those are the two ways, you know, like if you do wear a pendant, you can wear it under your shirt. Nobody can really see that you're wearing it if you're adverse to having jewelry on like like I was. What about like uh, could I do like an ankle bracelet or something like that? Sure. Cool. Anywhere at all close to your body and that will have its effect. Now, having talked about the effect, how does this work? I don't really know, but I do know that I think it is it's a frequency, a vibration of light in a flawless crystal that is greatly magnified, that's worn close to the body, interacts with with our body and our and our you know subtle bodies, if you will, and perhaps even at a quantum mechanical level where everything is vibrating light on a very deep, deep level, these gemstones, if they, they should be highly flawless, and then they have a particular frequency vibration of light that somehow is related to the planet, somehow is related to karma. I don't, uh, I don't understand that side of it. I mean, there was one of my teachers once said, karma is unfathomable, and for sure it is. Nobody can figure that out. But the gemstones, they seem to work. Uh, it took me 10, 12 years before I even considered it might work. But now, uh, almost 44 years in the business, uh, if it's the right quality gem, and you have your exact time and date of place of birth, and you buy the right type of gem, which has to be uh, quite flawless, then the results will come as they are predicted. Quite quite fascinating. Wow. Well, Jay, you've... 
you've sold me on anti-aging. You've sold me on getting a gemstone. And uh, you've also, you didn't have to resell me, but you're an awesome, awesome man. You're very fascinating. I love the way you talk. We have such natural rapport. So I'm excited to see you again in the future when you come to visit next. Before I let you go, I always let people just kind of give the last word on the show. Uh, anything you want to say to our audience? Well, uh, I wasn't expecting that question, but... <laughs> At 75 years, you do get a little bit of longevity, and with that, hopefully comes some wisdom. Just enjoy life. I think the purpose of life is to be happy, to learn to love and accept and be kind to everyone, and just count your blessings because it's a, it's a unique opportunity to be a human being, to be born on this planet, and there's lots to be learned, and just you know, do, do your best, be kind, and accept because there's a lot of things you can't change. Wow, that was a great answer. Thank you so much, Jay Boyle, everyone. There will be extensive notes for you to read, but you can always head over to astrologicalgemstones.com and find everything and more over there. You also can still find them on TV. And of course, the best way to support this show would be to head over to mikeyop.com. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com and sign up for the weekly letter. Thank you again, Jay, for coming on the show. And we will see you soon.